Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for part three of our live discussion on uh, atheistic socialism. Uh, please do give me a one in the chat if we have a connection, which I believe we do. Yep, I'm seeing it. So I think we're good there. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm glad to be back here today with Lloyd discussing socialism, also known as the atheistic religion. I never imagined that before we started this series, but it very much has the characteristics of a religion. Well, remember, we, we when we go to the discussion of the prophets of socialism, right, the original founders of socialism, modern socialism, and in fact, the founders of modern atheism, they explicitly state it is a religion. It's a replacement secular religion. It is Christianity with the divinity stripped out repurposed for its functional value and so thus it is a scientific religion so yeah so so secular humanists need to face up here they need to admit that they have no knowledge they're ignorant of the foundations of their religion and it is in fact literally a religion uh any other comment from you thaddeus yeah well uh you know i agree 100 percent um not only are our socialists and atheists unaware of this information, Christians are unaware as well. Uh, it all came as quite a surprise to me, and that's as someone who is quite involved in you know, religious studies type material. Um, the public at large, you know, zero clue whatsoever that the, the founders of these movements were saying we're creating a new religion. We're aiming to replace Christianity with a different religious structure. Yeah, correct. And yeah, so please let the atheists know that they are actually following a modern religion, a secular religion, which is just as fanatical and in, quite, <laughs> in fact is actually revolutionary. It has its own form of jihad, which is political revolution. So these are uh, so atheism and socialism are born out of a political and social movement, co-opting religion for the purposes of their political and social change to bring about their utopia on earth. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so let's pick up where we left off. And thanks again for joining me, Thaddeus. Much appreciated that we could do this tonight. And also thanks to everyone who's in the chat. Let's have a look. We have Villainous. Welcome, thank you for joining me. It was good chatting with you last week. We have Yaya, we have Voter. Dag se Voter, Um We have a guy called Reasoned Answers as well. I, yeah, that looks very reasonable, whatever he, answer he gave there. He said, hello everyone, that looks like a reasonable answer. Uh, we have Dodzor, we have Andrew Martin. Welcome, thank you. Um, actually, hold on, so let me, oh, let me do something before I forget. So, Andrew, let me find you. Uh, yeah. Okay, hold on. Okay, I've added you as a mod, Andrew. Um, <clears throat> we have Anna Katana, we have Ken Johnston, KJ, and um, he never returned as a horse. Thank you for the very kind comments. You always make such really nice comments, so I appreciate that and the support. Uh, the church has been infiltrated by the Freemasons and the Communists so that now Francis only talks about climate change. Uh, look, th this is very true. There, there has been an infiltration of the church, uh, both the Catholic Church as well as the Protestant churches and as I said if if you guys were aware of the of the failings within the Protestant Church you would be shocked as well there's it's just that the Catholic Church is one big bullseye you can see it it's one huge monolith whereas the Protestant churches are these fragmented individual sort of smaller targets you know but when you actually historically analyze the the, the failings within the Protestant churches you would be deeply shocked by the issues within it. Uh, this is not the story for today. Um, I'm not here to uh, to to create dissension or to, to cause an, well, cause a ruckus, but it's just that understand historically the the finger's always been pointed in one direction. And to be honest and to be what's the word? How would you phrase it, Thaddeus? Just to be how how would you phrase it? We also have to look at the other uh, side. Fair. To be fair, I mean, yeah. And. Um, yeah, so now the Pope, yeah, we all have a problem with the Pope. I mean, man, uh, as I said, the, the joke, what well, used to be, is the Pope Catholic? Well, now it's a serious question. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so guys, let's jump into where we left off. So previously, I'll go back one or two slides. So this is Chris Hedges. 
he wrote, and atheists have no room to gloat. Now, this is a from a review of his book. The book was originally called, I believe, I don't believe in atheists, right? The Dangerous Rise of the Secular Fundamentalist by Chris Hedges. Now, he has republished it under the new name, America's New Fundamentalists, when atheism becomes religion. And so this review in the New York Times tells us an atheists have, sorry, in the Washington Times, an atheists have no room to gloat. Pol Pot, Joseph Stalin, and Mao Tse Tung tallied tens of millions of kills between them in the 20th century alone. 20th century was the most lethal century in history. More people died under atheist communism than in the previous 19 centuries combined. So the absence of religion is no more protection against fanatical rampages than blind faith. And as we discussed previously, the very first atheist secular state in the world was founded after the French Revolution in France. And the first thing that they did was to slaughter everybody that stood against them, slaughtered everyone who did not willingly abandon religion. They created a genocide. Over 250,000 people were murdered in the name of atheism. Uh, your thoughts, Thaddeus, before I continue? Yeah, well, you know, we're told that uh, if we just all would become atheists, we'd have nothing to fight about anymore because religion causes all violence. And then we look at the foundation of the one of the earliest real atheist movements, and it's 100% founded in violence kind of undermines that claim a bit, doesn't it? It does. And in fact, the atheist states, the atheist government, have been literally the most genocidal, violent, brutal governments on earth in history. <laughs> and yeah, and it, it sounds like Islam. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting, but Islam kind of has this veneer on it, at least this, it has certain rules. Whereas what is interesting, I should do a talk on this sometime, I need to have a look at it. However, you must understand the word totalitarianism is a new word. It's a word used to describe new political movements. There was tyranny before, there was oppression before, but totalitarianism is something that is specific to atheist governments. Atheism in government inevitably turns totalitarian, turns tyrannical, oppressive, but totalitarianism is with a tyrant, do what he wants, everything is peachy. Totalitarianism utilizes the principle of random violence. People do not realize that under the communist regimes of the 20th century, someone like Stalin or Mao or Ceausescu or whoever would say, we need you, they would send a memo to someone in, in some random town in some random state and say, we need you to kill 10,000 enemies of the state, enemies of the revolution. And their job would have to be to go just pick 10,000 random people and kill them. And sometimes they'd kill 15,000 because they want to show that they're willing and eager to do their jobs, you know, because they don't want to be on that list next. These were randomly selected people. You had as good a chance of being selected if you were guilty as if you were innocent. This is something that was purely as a result of these atheist Marxist states, because there is no moral inhibition against it, whereas other systems actually have some kind of moral inhibition. Uh, your thoughts, that is? Yeah, well, Andrew Martin just put in a good comment that um, in the broadest sense, totalitarianism is characterized by strong central role that attempts to control and direct all aspects of individual life. And as long as there is a religious structure the, the dictator, you know, they might be authoritarian, they might have absolute political power, but as long as there's a religious structure, they don't really have full control, do they? Because there's this dueling authority between the religious figures. Even when, you know, it's a, it's a theocratic state, and in theory, the head of the state is the head of the religion as well, they're still, in principle, subject to the scriptures, subject to moral principles that their religion outlines. You get rid of religion, and suddenly that dictator really is in absolute control of every aspect of life. Yeah, he's not beholden to the morals of the, the creator that he serves or the God that he serves or whatever the case might be. Yeah, that, that falls away. So, yeah, that is... Um, yeah, so thanks, atheism, for the win. So, yeah, guys, we need to... History, we, we need to understand our history because if we forget the past we are just going to repeat the same errors in the future. 
Um, yeah, Islam is, it's not good, but it, it is different there. So, okay, so New York Times, the best-selling author, speaks out against those who attack religion to advance their own agenda. He accuses the new atheists led by Sham Harris, Richard Dawkins, and Christopher Hitchens of promoting a belief system that is not, as they claim, based on reason and science, but on a simplified worldview of us versus them, intolerance, and the false myths of human progress and moral superiority. And don't forget, these aims are exactly those of Marx, Lenin, Stalin, and Engels. There is no difference. So they are promoting the very aims of the communist giants of the 20th century. That last little bit there, the false myths of human progress and moral superiority, I, I think is absolutely key because a large percentage of atheist arguments are centered on this principle that the, the people of the past were inferior. They were morally inferior. They were intellectually inferior. They had no clue what they were talking about. And we're just so much better off today. And when you look at human history and you really look at it, yeah, I mean, things have changed, but really human beings haven't right mm -hmm. human beings are motivated by the same kinds of things that they always have been motivated motivated by greed motivated by self-interest motivated by power and it's only uh christianity really that puts a check on that so when the atheists are like you know human morals have progressed over time we've gone from being always at war with one another to living in peace and it's like well you're kind of not really seeing things the way they are you're kind of just looking at the present idealistically and looking at the past with glasses that color you to the way things actually were the only reason we have less wars now is because there how we have clear delineated powers and that they're not um, they know that if they try to attack one another and, you know, take someone else's land, that they will not win. It, it's not that they don't want to. It's not that uh, the modern states don't want to expand. It's just that they know they can't. It has nothing to do with some sort of grand progress brought on by rational thinking. Any progress there is is brought on by Christianity specifically, and most of that progress is mere illusionary. On that word progress, Marx was influenced by a philosopher, amongst many others, called Hegel, who developed the idea of the Hegelian dialectic. So let me try to oversimplify and butcher the concept uh, for the purposes of this discussion, because I was planning to do it in another show in the future, in the near future. But welcome, Ray Johnson and Marion, Your Highness. So, wow, Katie, thank you. Thank you very, very much. I'm so grateful. Thank you very much. Um, that's very kind of you for the donation. Thank you. Now, understand, the reason they called progressives and the reason they believed in progress and that mankind was superstitious and primitive, this is actually what Marx, Lenin, and Stalin and so on taught. This was part of their philosophy. So the Hegelian dialectic is that mankind starts off primitive. He starts off believing in superstition. Then comes this new phase. So what they have is this, this they believe in this historical materialism. There's this endless push like this wave, this river that is constantly flowing forward towards progress. In the beginning, you've got primitive man. At the end, you've got the state of communism. So you start in this primitive state. The next state of man, this evolution, is organized religion. What happens is that when the old meets the new, there is this conflict. There's this conflict, right? Thesis, you know, um, antithesis, synthesis, right? Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. This is what he believes, obviously. And Marx promoted this, Lenin, Stalin. So the communists have this idea embedded that history is materialistic and progressive, this inexorable forward progress, morally, spiritually, etc., etc. Now, so from organized religion, the next step is that man moves towards capitalism. After capitalism, the next superior system is, of course, socialism. And socialism is the engine, the method, the system, right, the caliphate, that will take us to the final Garden of Eden, which is communism. Just like we go to paradise, right? They go to communism. 
Communism is the final step. Socialism is what drives you there. So this is when they say, well, progress, mankind is primitive. Well, because if you go read Marx or Lenin or Engels, you read their works, they'll tell you, man was primitive. And then atheists said, that's primitive superstition. Well, it's exactly the words verbatim that Lenin, Stalin, Marx, Mao, Pol Pot, Hitler, all of them are saying it. So, so here's the thing. Why are these atheists repeating these guys? Are you saying are you saying in the same camp you agree exactly with what they say? I mean, like, does that make you that, you know, that, that, that quote, like, are we the baddies? You might want to ask yourself that. Uh, your thoughts, that is? <laughs> yeah, good, good question there. Um, you know, I, I'm not suggesting by any means that the average atheist has read Marx. Or but they repeat the bait in the that, very same yeah, words and concepts. Yeah, but they've got in the ideas nonetheless, <laughs> that, that the ideas have been handed down. Even if they didn't directly read it, they heard it from someone who maybe heard it from someone who read it. Yeah. So, as I said, useful idiots of the Marxists. So, so let me see. Okay, now let's move on here. Okay. So, last word about Saint Simon. Now, we remember we mentioned this guy, Saint Simon. This is the the, the this is the creator of modern socialism, right? Uh, where he created the religion called Christian socialism. Right? And he said that ethics would become a science to be calculated and defined with precision and certainty. Do you have an ethical calculator in your pocket? Maybe you can buy one in the store? You know, an ethics calculator? Yeah, yeah I, I, Amazon sells, you know, everything under the sun, but I, I don't think you can buy that on Amazon. Yep. And of course, atheists will often say, we're here to kill war, we're here to end war. You know, the left is always, we're, we're going to end war because socialism, it says, in the process of reaching reason by banishing religion, they're going to end conflict forever. Wonderful utopian pipe dream. That did not work. Okay, so now notice his religion of scientific atheism formed the mold from which many others would take their shape. He was taken seriously by, amongst others, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Right, so we'll continue. The greatest good, commies again. So we've spoken about this. And if you look at the book, The Political Economy of Progress by John Stuart Mill and Modern Radicalism, there's this constant talk of utilitarianism, right? The greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. Now, Thaddeus, would it make you happy to pack all of these annoying Abduls and atheists into a spaceship and send them off to the sun? Well, uh, maybe I should plead the fifth on that. I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a little, it's a little yes and a little no, but... Uh, I certainly see where you're going with that. But, I mean, understand, so atheists have, atheists find themselves in a moral dilemma. Because there is no divine lawgiver, because there is no divine moral code, they have to now somehow find a source for an authoritative moral code. Often they will say things, well, society will decide that. Now, of course, the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people, well, you know what? It makes me happy to, I don't know, take drugs. And, you know, so therefore, and everyone's happier on drugs, so, so therefore it becomes morally good because everyone likes it. Is it good because everyone's doing it? Is it right because everyone's doing it? And what if tomorrow someone decides, you know, no, we've changed our mind. Understand? So this means you have no moral foundation. This is purely just, uh, what's the word? It's, it's, um, it's, sorry, what's the word for that? That is when it's not permanent, when it's simply um, relative. It's morally relative. So this is a this is a distinct problem for atheism. Uh, your thoughts, that is? Yeah. Uh, you, you know, it's it's a principle that it sounds really nice and good um, when you first hear it, but then when you think about it, like, well, does that actually make sense? I mean, for example, right, you know, the, um, the American slave trade, considered one of the greatest evils in history by most people, at the time, it certainly was making far more people happy that they were making lots of money off these slaves than people who were opposing it. So it doesn't really work. Plus, the atheists, or at, at least the wokest, will be very quick to say that you know Christianity is wrong, it has the following moral teachings that are, are very wrong. Well, depending on which teaching you're looking at, you know, either right now more than half the people supported it or at least in the past more than half the people supported it so you're telling me that the things that you oppose were actually good at the time very interesting well that's what situation. muslims say don't they well what muhammad did then was fine at the time 
it's not fine now, except Muhammad is the perfect example for all time. So, I don't know, man. That, that sounds a bit fishy to me. <laughs> Doesn't pass the sniff test. And thank you, Katie Naguski, for uh, signing up with the channel. I really appreciate the support. Thank you very, very much. Uh, much appreciated. Yeah. So, what happened historically is that there was a huge discussion on the relationship between happiness and morality. And in this climate, an instrumental view of morality appeared. What is useful? Right. So there was no eternal foundation. Ethical codes are seen as ways of securing a happy life. But within the communist utopias of the Soviet Union, for instance, killing Christians was not seen as a problem. Putting people in gulags was not seen as a problem. The greatest happiness for the greatest number of people, right? Well, the people in charge were very happy. So now much of this enlightened thought is reflected in Jeremy Bentham's 1907 Introduction to Morals and Legislation. Bentham argues that the moral quality of an action should be judged by its consequences on human happiness. Now, you know what? The Germans decided they would euthanize all of the people who were not mentally fit, in their opinion. That made them happy. So, this indeed. is just license to do evil. Yes? Yeah, indeed. You know, we think of the Holocaust now as the killing of the Jewish people. And while it included that, that was only one of the many groups that were targeted. The, yeah. the physically disabled the mentally disabled were targeted and it's very easy to see why eliminating people who you know have limited productivity towards society would make more people happy than it would make upset um, and this is exactly the kind of thing that that proves that this principle isn't really a very good principle yeah. at all you know you eliminate you eliminate that those people who you know aren't contributing anything to society those people who are just dragging us down and we'll all be better off is a true statement in it but it's also a statement that nearly everyone would agree is horrifically morally speaking yeah and andrew mott says be the tyrant define happiness as what you want then eliminate all those who oppose you thus maximal happiness yes it's that's simply it. So, yeah, and don't forget, Marx really loved what Darwin had to say, the survival of the fittest. And to allow those who are unfit to procreate would be to sully the gene pool. Progress would be halted. You would be interfering with evolution. So, therefore, it is better to kill off those. So, understand where this leads. This leads to the kind of genocides that we saw in the 20th century. And, of course, we always hear, don't push your morals on me, but happily, notice, they will legislate their morals on you. Is some guy in a dress, and you call him he, well, go to jail. Why? Because that's legislated now. See, they will happily legislate their morals on you, because those secularists are hypocrites. So, let's continue. Uh, the, the Greatest Happiness of the Greatest Number. So this is a book from a book called The Political Economy of Progress, John Stuart Mill and Modern Radicalism by Joseph Persky. Uh, just to give us a little overview of this idea of this utilitarianism. The utilitarian commitment to the greatest happiness of the greatest number established a powerful, if somewhat vague, norm that continues to push public decision-making towards radicalism. This is published by Oxford Academic Press, so it's from Oxford University. So apparently this greatest happiness of the greatest number. Now don't forget, these people define happiness in their, in their moral terms. Now we are seeing people that want to legalize pedophilia to make them happy. So therefore, they are pushing legislation towards that direction. The credo generated little more than apologetics. Notice it's not based on reason. It developed apologetics so that they could use rhetoric to persuade people to follow this point of view. Like Bentham, Mill remained reluctant to explicitly identify what is the greatest number with the working classes. But the logic pushed him towards a materialistic understanding of the credo. So understand, we look now again, we're looking at Marxism, the working class, the proletariat, and the materialistic understanding. This is entirely atheistic. When they say materialist or secularist, they mean atheist. George Bernard Shaw, I am God, and here is God. Not is it completed. Oh, George, did you know George Bernard Shaw was God, that is? Uh, I didn't, but apparently he is. <laughs> yeah, so he's still advancing towards completion. Notice the term progressive. These are progressives. You see, they are evolving. This inevitable movement towards evolution. 
right? Just in so much as I am working for the purpose of the universe, for the greatest good, you see, I'm helping the universe progress, working for the good of the whole of society, for the good of humanity, for the utopia, and the whole world, instead of merely looking after my personal ends. Think of the children. Somebody think of the children. Yeah, Lovely words, but horrific intent at the end of the day. The outcomes are always genocidal. Yeah, I mean, we see the same attitude in, in you know, all the writings that we've looked at. Uh, of course, when they say something like, I am God, they're not really meaning that, you know, they're the divine creator of the universe or anything like that. They're not insane. What their their meaning is, is that for all practical purposes, uh, I replace God because there is no God. So I'm God now. And I am the highest power that exists. Yeah, because they believe that mankind is the highest expression of the universe, the highest, the highest form of of matter, right? The highest evolution of matter in the universe. So socialism is the precursor to communism. We're on slide thirty-eight of forty-four. So this, uh, it's close to the end of this presentation. So the full greatest good philosophy is known as utilitarianism. Now, I will no note here, because you know that there's one particular theologian that I really have a beef with, and the more I read, the more I learn about what this guy did, the more he hacks me off, let me tell you. His name, as you all know, is Martin Luther. And <laughs> he changed the way that people viewed God. From a Catholic point of view, there was the idea of who is God, how do we aspire to be like God, God to be God-like. Luther changed the view of God to a functional one. Now, don't forget, when atheism defined itself in the United States as a religion, when, when atheists fought in court at the Supreme Court level to, to be legitimately recognized as a religion, and they succeeded, they won. And, and in the U.S., atheism is a religion. It is legally recognized. They utilized a new definition of religion. They took the old substantive definition where you had to have God, and you worshiped God according to the biblical principles. And they said, no, we have a functional definition. What does God do? What does religion do? What is the function in terms of social cohesion, etc., etc., in terms of mental, you know, resolving people's mental anguish, giving them calm and peace and so on. They utilized a functional definition. And the guy that, one of the people behind this whole thing of changing the view of religion from substantive to functional was this Martin Luther. Man, one day I need to talk about that guy because, man, he gets on my toes. So... So in Marxist socialism, workers contribute as much as they can to the greater good, and then they all share equally in that good. Isn't that just wonderful? The use of these services is unequal, yet everyone is equally responsible for contributing to them based on their ability or level of income. Workers do what they can to contribute and take only what they need in return. That, I mean, man, I knew it when I was five years old this doesn't work. Good intentions. The road to hell, man. Stalin says, we stand for the withering away of the state. At the same time, we stand for the strengthening of the strongest state power that has ever existed. Socialism is centralized control of everything. So he wants the withering away of the state to bring communism, but he's also standing for consolidating the strongest centralized state to ever exist. Is this contradictory? Yes, it is contradictory. But this contradiction fully reflects Marx's dialectics. No, it didn't. Stalin was asked this by a journalist, I believe, and this was his reply. Uh, your thoughts, that is? Yeah, I mean, he's right um, in, in a sense that, you know, they're, they're saying that socialism is all about the, the rise of the workers or communism is all about the rise of the workers and the getting rid of the state. But what they actually what it's actually been in practice is a dictator seizing complete and total control of everyone and making everyone equal by everyone being extremely poor, except for him and his buddies. Yeah. So now Marx did write. Now look, <laughs> Marx is another long story. There's a lot more to Marx than people realize. So yeah, Stalin omitted mentioning that Marx believed that contradictions were to be exposed and overcome, not accepted and embraced, at least in theory. At least in theory, <laughs> not in practice. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, look, someone's mentioning about the pedophilia. Understand, if a child is just matter with no soul, right? If it's just matter, you, it's just matter. It doesn't matter. Right? Mm -hmm. You're not harming anything of consequence. So, yeah. Uh, so, let's look at the French Revolution for a moment. We're burning it down for justice and equality. Sorry, this French Revolution, BLM, 
Sorry, no, no, no. Sorry, let me, let me get this now. Hold on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I, I just let me not get the name wrong. Hold on. There's a there's a movement in the states that also burned it down for justice and equality. They were called OBLM, I recall. Only Black <laughs> Lives Matter. I believe was the name of the organization. Uh, they were very very active not that long ago. They were burning things down for justice and equality, including the businesses and cars owned by black people. Yeah, uh, just to be clear, though, the O is silent. It is there, but it's silent, so you don't pronounce it. Yeah, yeah. So, so I just wanted to make sure that I that I got it right. It's yeah, you know. Let's just uh, let's let's just there we go. I fixed it for them. It's there cool. you go. <laughs> right. So now they have a desire to tackle social injustice and to do good, good according to what standard. Essentially. This is a restatement of the problem of evil as dealt with by the Gnostics. The Gnostics also had their own complex idea of how do we deal with the problem of evil, and they came up with their own particular mythology. The interesting part is that when you look at superstition, Christianity as a religion defines itself based on history. The account is historical. Now, you may not maybe necessarily believe Jesus is the Son of God, but historically, he existed. This is not in dispute, although, of course, every other atheist will dispute you on that, but whatever. So... It's a historical account. So we moved from mythology to historical, right? And the thing is that when you move away from the historical, you revert to the mythological. So in fact, if you look at atheism, it's based on mythology. It's based on the mythological. So uh, your comment, Thaddeus, before I go? Oh, yeah, well, that, that comment there was, uh, was right on. I don't really have anything to add to that, but I, I did find it... Um, quite humorous that when you alluded to, you know, atheists denying basic history when they're the rational free thinkers who are only following the facts. Yeah. So now the French Revolution of 1789 is born from a desire to create a socialist society. Right. And of course, it failed. So what did they say? The CAA sabotaged the effort. MI6 sabotaged the revolution. Right, which they still say today, like like the failure of socialism in Venezuela, the CIA sabotaged it. They were saying it in 1789 already, the CIA sabotaged the revolution, and they planned a second revolution. Right Now, from a socialist perspective, the French Revolution was a failure. It failed to bring equality. It further stoked radicalization from a sense that the revolution had been thwarted, not from a sense that the ideas were immoral, evil, and stupid. I just so by the way, the words in the brackets were not in the original article. I put those in myself. That's my creativity right there on the page. So the revolution apparently needed to go further to create social and economic equality. So in other words, these people are blind to their failings. They cannot admit failure. They cannot admit they were wrong. And they are always kicking the can down the road. May Andrew Tate be... <laughs> Welcome, Daniel. Uh, you know, we spoke about, I think in December last year, about doing a stream somewhere in January. I think it's uh, roughly 12 months later. We should revisit that idea again. <laughs> Okay, so uh, that is any comments before I go on? Uh, yeah, well, not really a comment, just a, a bit of a mm -hmm. joke there. You said that, you know, those words in the brackets are, are your, um, you know, your addition to the text. But I think you were just clarifying what the text meant, like Muslim translators, when they, they translate the Quran or the Hadith. You know, you just put in parentheses what the text really means. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, so yeah, a couple of things. So he never returned as a horse. It just hasn't been done right yet. Yeah, yeah. They they're gonna get it right next time for sure. They're trying it in South Africa right now, and it's just going great. Except the CIA is undermining it. <laughs> so, um, uh, someone said, yeah, I'd like to hear the details on Lloyd's full perspective on Luther. So would I actually. I need to go and do a lot more research. I um, the more I dig, the more I find, and it's it's a pretty convoluted rabbit hole. And then someone said. Um, um, my opinion is Luther was very unpleasant, but folk, he was, no, you have no idea how unpleasant he was. He was far more unpleasant than you realize. He was used by God at a particular time. Personally, if you ask me, he was used by Satan. That's my, I say this as a Protestant because man, looking at his life, I, I have no respect for the man, roughly zero. And great people do have serious flaws. This man reveled in his and, um, yeah, uh, just, just. At some point, I will. I'm still trying to untangle the whole source of where he got his stuff. And so far, I have him down to about 
14th century Italy, where he seems to have gone off the rails. At least with those ideas that Luther imbibed came from there. And um, uh, yeah, so Lloyd recall you mentioned in another presentation that communism was quoted as being the new Catholicism. Yes, explicitly it was. So the Communist Manifesto was originally written as the Cath the Communist Confession of Faith, as a catechism. So it was the catechism of their religion. And Engels then told Marx, hey, before we publish this, maybe we should not make it so explicitly religious. And um, socialism, when it was founded in 1825, at least when it was formalized and presented as this new religion in 1825, it was originally called Christian socialism. It was, according to its founders and its prophets of the day, the philosophers who formed the idea and propounded and, expo and exegeted the idea and uh, promoted it. It was the Roman Catholic Church with all the divinity stripped out and made into a scientific form of religion. Um, so, yeah, it is. So, of course, they have to attack the Catholic Church. They have to attack all Christianity, all the church, all churches to 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 replace the ideas, to replace the churches. Uh, Thaddeus, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, we, we've seen that over and over again that, you know, it's not just a we're not just getting rid of Christianity. We're not just getting rid of the churches. We're not just getting rid of the the Catholic um, hierarchy. We're replacing it. We're replacing it with something else. Um, it, it's never about just getting rid of it. It's always about getting rid of and replacing. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so let's, let's continue. Um... So briefly, just a short aside to these proletariat workers, these farm workers here. They were called the saint Colon, or however you pronounce that. So this was a workers' revolution, the first brown shirts. They were the common people of the lower classes in the late 18th century France. They many, many of them became radical, and they were militant partisans of the French Revolution in response to their poor quality of life under the Ancien Regime. The word saint Colon, which is opposed to that of the aristocrats, so the opposites so of the poor people. Don't forget, the socialists, the left, constantly talks about the poor, the poor, the poor. They used for the first time on 20th February 1791 by Jean Benablah, blah, blah, blah. And they spoke of the army of the poor, right? The uprising of the proletariat. So the word came into vogue during the demonstration of 1792. So this is where Marx will get some of these ideas of the uprising of the farmers, right? The uprising of the poor. Stalin himself, actually Lenin, also realized, oh, you can't just have the poor, you need the farmers as well, you need to feed people. And then, of <laughs> course, Stalin changed that and said, hold on, no, 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 the farmers own land, therefore the farmers are, are an enemy of the state. He killed them all, and of course a lot of people died because of starvation. <clears throat> so, yeah, so they were judged by other revolutionaries as radicals because they advocated a direct democracy without a parliament. In other words, mob rule. So... These people just advocated for mob rule and they became the brown shirts to enforce the will of the political will of the of the people who wanted to foment this revolution. So let, let me just okay. Now the most fundamental political ideas were social equality, economic equality, and popular democracy. They do not use these words the same way that you and I do. When they say equality, there's a story the Greeks tell of the bed of Procrustes. Uh, thank you very much for the reference to the book that I was just given. Uh, I will have a look at that. So, so have a look at the myth of the bed of Procrustes. So Procrustes made the perfect bed. And he would invite people to lie in it. But the problem is, people didn't fit the bed. So if they were too short, he had to stretch them. He had to, he had to torture and stretch them. And, if the, and some were too tall. So he had to cut off their legs or cut off their feet or cut off their shins. right? Because the bed was perfect, but the people were not. So... When they speak of equality, they don't mean... Because within the writings of these socialists... Yeah, make people fit the bed, exactly. So when they speak of equality, what they mean is that no one is smarter than anyone else. No one has more power than anyone else. No one is more educated. And no one is wealthier. In other words, you are equally poor, equally unintelligent, equally miserable in terms of your social status. This is what they implicitly and explicitly write within their notes. Economic equality means equally poor. Popular democracy, they, don't know, they do not use the word democracy the way you and I do. They campaign for more democratic constitution, price controls. The left constantly speaks of our democracy. They mean their socialist democracy. Right? This is a different way, just like Muslims reinterpret words. What does the word messiah mean in Islam? That 
They wanted harsh laws against political enemies and economic legislation to assist the needy. Does that sound like what's happening politically today, Thaddeus? It does. Um, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Yeah. And the socialist communist movements have always targeted the poor. And they've always said, Ed, you, the reason that you are in the situation you are in isn't anything to do with you. It's entirely to do with those evil elite rulers. Let's get rid of them. And then what they don't say is, and replace them with different elite rulers who are us. Yeah. No, exactly. Um, yeah. So now, so they utilized political pressure. And of course, the, what they did was they utilized the police courts, right? Within, as part of their political movement. So the police and the courts received thousands of denunciations as traitors and as supposed conspirators, death threats. So they attacked the police. In fact, they defunded the police, believe it or not. Right? They attacked the courts. They attacked the police because they felt that these people were traitors and unless they operated with the mob, they were against the mob. You understand? These ideas that you're seeing today, these are old ideas that go back to the founding of socialism as a revolutionary movement, a jihadi movement. So the more they change, as Thaddeus said, the more they stay the same. The Sanko law right, also populated the ranks of paramilitary forces charged with physically enforcing the policies and legislation of the revolutionary government, a task that commonly included violence and the carrying out of executions against perceived enemies of the revolution. So these people were disaffected. They were then recruited like OBLM to deal with the supposed enemies of the state, which included the legislature and the police. That is your thought there? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't have anything to add. To add. You nailed it. Yeah. So, guys, we are yeah, we're nearly done. I think two more slides. So, the socialist conspiracy, and this is not a theory, right? So, we all speak of there's a conspiracy going on. I mean, these days, the WF and so on, these guys are in your face. They're not hiding it. They're not, they're not making a secret of it. So, Francois Noël, Caius Gracchus Babeuf, commonly known as Babeuf, lived 1760 to 1797. He was architect of what is called the Conspiracy of Equals. Now, Caius Gracchus was a Roman politician. He was a land reform, land redistribution advocate. Socialist, in other words. He believed in redistributing land to the poor. Taking from the rich, giving to the poor. Taking your land, by the way. So, Babeuf was a conspiratorialist. He advocated a second revolution. We need a new revolution. After they killed 265,000 people and, you know, destroyed thousands of homes and, you know, they needed a new revolution to, to do it right this time, to do it correctly this time. And they wanted to create a recognizable proto-socialist republic because the last socialist revolution somehow didn't produce socialism. Notice he advocated for the poor. What about the poor? He called for revolt. He called for social democracy. We're social democrats. Social democrats. No, no, that's completely different to socialists. That's a completely different thing. It's like Mars and Jupiter. They're completely different planets. And the abolition of private property to create social equality. This is just standard Marxist drivel. No difference. Thaddeus, you're nodding your head? Yeah, I mean, it goes back to what someone in the chat earlier said. Uh, you know, it, it failed before, but... Let's just do it again, and, and it'll work this time. Yeah, it's no different. So these ideas go back to the French Revolution. These are atheist ideas. Don't forget, these ideas could only flourish within an atheist worldview. Therefore, they had to abolish religion because the Christian idea stood completely antithetical to these ideas of running the world. So therefore, atheism is a worldview. It's a religious worldview. It's an anti-Christian worldview. It's, a, it's an, an, an entire doctrine. So although the terms anarchist and communist did not exist in Babeuf's lifetime, they've been both used by later scholars. They've both been used by later scholars to describe his ideas. Communism was first used in English by Goodwin Bombi in a conversation with those he described as the disciples of Babeuf. So the communists were conspiratorialists. They lit he literally had a conspiracy. He's famous because he had a successful conspiracy. He nearly overthrew the government. He raised an army. He was literally conspiring. He has been called the first revolutionary communist. But Berth wrote, society must be made, not voted to, must be made to operate in such a way that it eradicates once and for all the desire of a man to become richer 
or wiser or more powerful than others. That is your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, well, good luck with that. I, I don't know how you can ra eradicate someone's desire. Um, you know, Christianity looks at the world and we agree that this is the problem of the world, that, um, you know, man has uh, unclean desires, that, that man desires to be rich, that man desires to control other men, that, that every human looks at themselves and tries to elevate themselves to the status of God. Um, the problem is they're eliminating the one thing that, that works to counteract that and saying, yeah, we could do we don't know how it's going to work, but this is what we need to do. We just need to do it. We don't, forget about the planning. We just got to do it. Yeah. No, so understand, these are all good intentions. This is the road to hell paved with good intentions. And these are all to a man, atheists. Understand this. Atheism is responsible for this. First, they had to be atheists so they could reject the biblical view of the world. And then they could implement this because morally it wasn't repugnant then, right? In the Manifesto of the Equals, Babeuf wrote, so this is prior to the Manifesto, the Communist Manifesto, he wrote the Manifesto of the Equals. He wrote, the French Revolution was nothing but a precursor of another revolution, one that will be bigger, more solemn, and which will be the last. Well, that's the Socialist Revolution, you see, which will bring communism. <laughs> so, yeah. The attempts of the governing directory, so the French government at that point, after the French Revolution, there was a government for a short while called the Directory. So the attempts of the governing directory to deal with the economic crisis of the day gave Babeuf his historical importance. And this is an old painting or drawing, line drawing of the time. This was his conspiracy of equals being stopped just in time. So you can see he's the snake. He's got a snake around his waist. The snake has a hook that's going to stab Liberty, Lady Liberty in the back. And he's about to stab Lady Liberty in the back, and he gets stopped just in time. So this was called the Conspiracy for Equality. So he's among the very first to advocate socialism as a political institution for solving the problems of society. In other words, a political religion. Socialism will solve the problems of society. Right? Of course, they just tried it. It had failed. He was going to, just going to try it again. He was credited with applying the word terrorist to the Jacobins of 1793-94, so the first modern usage of this term. He called for the establishment of a republic of equals, the socialist republic. His theories, which formed the basis for 19th century socialism and communism. Thaddeus, you're, you're nodding. Uh, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it, it's very interesting. We, we, it, the more we go through this, the more things that we learn that... Uh, you know, we're like, everything we know is wrong because we, we thought that Marx invented socialism, or at least Engels um, did. And, and now we're finding, no, actually, it goes back further. It, yeah. Very odd. It does, and no, it's explicitly anti-Christian. It's All of these are explicitly anti-Christian movements. So you attracted a following of former Jacobins. These are the guys who did the French Revolution. They opened a club at the Pantheon. In February 1796, the government closed the club and planned to take actions against the group, which was becoming a political menace. He founded a secret directory of public safety. So he was going to start a revolution to kill tens of thousands of people called the Directory of Public Safety, the Clean Air Act, which is like a pollution act or something. And they were going to plan a re an insurrection. He was betrayed by an informant called George Griesel, and he and the leaders of the movement were then arrested. And in 1797, he was condemned to death and executed the very next day. His tactical strategies provided a model for left-wing movements of the 19th century as the modus operandi, the means to the end of socialist society. And he was revered as a hero by 19th to 21st century revolutionaries because of his advocacy of communism and his conviction that a small, secret elite could overthrow a government by illegal, violent, conspiratorial means to bring socialism that is so a small secret elite overthrows the small public elite and and everything just becomes utopia this is the dream of socialism yeah they're doing it for your own good so understand these ideas are not new they're old they're an atheist worldview right so let's have a look. Uh, you guys hopefully can read this. This is from 1800 to 1848. We have two more slides left. The Rise of Utopian Socialism. This book is one of very few copies that are still left in the world. This is one of, one of very few. 
The development of socialism from utopia to science. Venezuela didn't fail at all. No, no, it's a utopia based on science. Hola, Islam mentira o verdad. And um, <laughs> uh, Andrew Mott says, kill everyone who opposes us, utopia. I mean, that's like Tacitus who says, you know, they, they, they created a slaughter, I believe, he said, and then called it peace. You know, they just wiped out everyone and called that peace. Right. Or so, just yeah. like uh, Islam, you know, well, the war will be over once the whole world is Muslim because, you know, the non-Muslims are the house of war. So you get rid of them and there's no more war, even though factually speaking, most Muslim violence is against other Muslims. Eh, yeah. Ignore that fact. Now, welcome, Arkitsune. Welcome. Good to see you. And Serif. Yeah, don't forget. Atheism is the default position. What's that? What's that? What's it? Um, what's it really? Brian. What, what's his name? Brian. What's his face? That 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 really low IQ atheist. What's what's his name? Oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> took me a second to figure out who you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, Brian. Whoever. Like, I mean, seriously, that guy's IQ is in the toilet. But he was like, atheism is the default position. Well, you know what? Muslims say Islam is the default position. You're all born Muslims. Well, you're all born atheists. So I wish you guys would just get together, go fight in the corner, wipe each other out, and leave us alone, right? Because, I mean, only you know, there can only be one, right? Now, notice this here. Development of socialism from utopia to science. And look at this title here. Socialism, Utopian and Scientific by Frederick Engels. Right? <clears throat> Fantastic stuff. So why utopian socialism? Right? Um, Alpha Omega, um, I get your point. You're talking about World War II, but we're on a different topic, and you know your agenda is distracting at this point. So if you don't mind, just uh, we can have that discussion another time. All right. So now, advocates wanted to create utopias in the form of model villages or model societies, perfect societies where people would do perfect things. They all failed. And later socialists, of course, took up failed ideas. Now, Einstein told us that, you know, when you keep repeating the same thing over and over and you keep getting the same results, that is insanity. So by that definition, these people are clinically insane. So Marx and Engels coined the term utopian socialists in their 1848 work, The Communist Confession of Faith, to attack this group. The name stuck. Now, Marx and Engels attacked the utopian socialists because he said these guys have stupid ideas the ideas will never work this socialism this utopian socialism is dumb and then they go and release a book called utopian socialism because it's they they, they want their utopian socialism that is this will never work we're just gonna steal the idea <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like no no just just we don't like those utopians so we like our utopian socialism yeah so, yeah, so yes, you were born as a Muslim and you were born as an atheist, okay? D don't, don't question, don't be a bigot, you know, just, just, just consume product, okay? So, it's that simple. You were born an atheist and you were born a Muslim. Just, just, just go on. So, Engels then published his best-selling <coughs> Development of Socialism from Utopia to Science in Paris in 1880, okay? So, because he's a hypocrite, so he attacked other socialists who said that this is the utopian system and then he goes and publishes his own book saying no 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 we figured out we've got it right yeah <laughs> mushroom thank you very very much i really really i'm grateful appreciate that thank you um it's very kind um yeah so now we meet a guy called robin owen robert owen sorry british socialist he created model villages in britain and his followers then created these model villages in the united states Right, So he was a firm advocate of the Enlightenment ideas of the time. And remember, I've shown you that when you compare the Enlightenment ideas, they're the same as the secular humanist ideas. So the, like the American Humanist Association or the Catholic, uh, sorry, Catholic Canadian Humanist Association. And then when you read the principles of the Church of Satan, they're identical. There's actually no difference. Right. So, yeah. His big idea is if you put people in a bad situation, okay, then you produce bad people. But if you put people in a good situation, then you produce good people. So in other words, nature versus nurture. And he said, no, no, no. If you put them in a nice housing estate with pretty parks and trees and flowers, you're going to get perfect people. But if they grow up in the slums, they'll be bad. So all you've got to do is take all those migrants from, from Guatemala and Honduras, drop them in the middle of, I don't know, Martha's Vineyard, and 
hey presto you're gonna have perfect people just like that uh that is yeah i mean this is one of the two competing ideas of the nature of humanity um that it, you know has kind of been dueled out in, in philosophy over history um we know which side Christianity's on, right? We we know that according to the the Christian narrative, that man is um, fallen, that man is inherently sinful, is uh, prone to uh, you know to do bad things, and then you have the other side that's saying, you know, man's basically good. It's just other men who are causing him. They they don't use they don't say other men they say society or they they say you know the corrupt system or whatever but what they're really saying is other men um, how does that work exactly then you know all the all people are good it's just other people who causes them to be bad um, yeah it's yeah, a very stuff. unrealistic view of people these people have no idea of human nature so you say the environment in which people brought up was important so. What he was seeing around him was terrible working conditions. So he created model villages to create good people who would work together harmoniously in a cooperative way. Do you guys remember the Summer of Love Chaz Chop in Seattle? You know, that was, that was an awesome experiment. That went really well. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, so Alpha Omega says the, the communists tried to break apart the family and the state. Um, it was one of Marx's principles. Marx had 10 fundamental principles of communism or socialism. And one of those, I think number three, is the destruction or the abolition of the family because the family is a bourgeois idea. It's a corruption of the way that... That's why you must have a village to raise a child. You cannot... The parents cannot. Hence, you're seeing this now in the schools in the U.S. Educators are now the new evangelists. They're the ones who are supposed to raise your child and indoctrinate them. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much, Vilnius. Much appreciated. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, Vilnius has just joined the channel. Thank you very much. And also, he now became known as the father of British socialism. This is the socialist utopia called New Harmony in Indiana that he created in 1825. Were you aware of the studies? Oh, uh, you know, I'm glad that we've been living in perfect harmony since 1825. Yeah. So, just to me, but I'm glad that that's the case. Yeah, no, so, so clearly... Um, <laughs> that woke neighborhood with their own currency and language. Yep, yeah, that one. Yeah, maps and communism is an education. Yep. So Owen had visions of a real, self-sufficient cooperative founded on these values. He bought 30,000 acres of land in Indiana and called it New Harmony to create a utopia, a workers' utopia, just like the Soviet Union. Remember, this was the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, not communists. No, there hasn't been a communist state yet. The community fragmented and then stagnated. He founded some successful socialist and cooperative groups, such as the Grand National, blah, blah trade union, and blah, blah, blah. And he thus cemented his credentials as an early socialist. All right. So now... If you could, yeah? if you could pull that picture back up real quick. Uh, notice what this utopia has. You live right next to your factory? Has, well, it has a wall around it to protect it. You know, to protect it from the outside or, you know, to keep the people in. Just like, uh, I don't know, East Berlin, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. East Germany, you know, wall. It must, and don't forget, the, the East, so the, so the Berlin Wall, right? The, the, the Iron Curtain, right? The Berlin Wall was known in Germany as the, um, I think, the, the Antifascist is the Schutzwall. The Antifascist Wall of Protection or the Antifascist Protection Wall. So we were the fascists, right? The, the West was the fascists, and this was the wall of protection against the fascists. Yeah. No. So this is Etienne Cabet. Now, he was going to create, in the U.S., a perfect... He, this was his next utopian state. These are atheists, okay? These are not Catholics, just so, by the way. They're not Baptists either, all right? So pedestrians were going to walk on the right. Everybody was going to do everything according to the rules, because, man, he had rules for perfection, I wonder, it's like the Sharia. Hmm. Okay. So, he was born in 1788 in France. Okay. But he died in St. Louis, Missouri. He was a U.S.-French socialist. He was the founder of a communal settlement at Nauvoo in Illinois, which he bought from, well, we'll get to that in a moment. He was, had a career as a teacher, a lawyer, a revolutionist, and political exile. He published a novel, Voyage en Carré, 
about his theories on the ideal community, his novel. So to put his ideas into practice, he and 1,500 people landed in New Orleans in 1848 and 1849. Thank you, Hillside. Very grateful. Thank you. Right. So he then purchased the old Mormon settlement at Nauvoo, which had 20,000 people. So the Mormons successfully had a long-standing community of 20,000 people that they were growing and then went somewhere else, right? So he, of his originally 1,500, he only took 280 settlers there to start Ikaria. The settlement was at best a compromise, for he was unable to put many of his, of his ideas into practice. So even on a small scale, these ideas did not function. The population never exceeded 1,800. In 1856, dissension arose. Cabay left with 180 followers for St. Louis, where he soon died. Icarian colonies were established at Charlton near St. Louis, at Corning, Iowa, dissolved in 1884, and at Cloverdale, California, dissolved in 1895. So these socialist ideas were tried. These perfect communities have been tried and failed. And they just have to keep trying again. Yeah, it's san insanity. Thaddeus, your thoughts? Well, notice that this society was founded only of true believers, you know, people who believed everything about this. It, you know, forget about the, the dissenters messing things up uh, and, you know, the state having to genocide the people who disagree. Here, they're, you know, everyone is 100 percent on board and it still failed miserably. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, just so briefly, I'm going to show a little bit about, let me just see, I've only got a couple of slides left. I know I can keep saying that, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I know I keep saying that, but uh, let's have a look at his ideas here. Um, so, this is from his novel. Now, these are the ideas that he put into practice. The novel was basically a novel to, to write his ideas. He, this is a, a letter that someone writes home, okay, to tell them about this 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 community that they live in. How heartbroken I feel when I think of France and see the happiness enjoyed by the people of Icaria. Concerning food, this first need of man, okay? Here, everything is regulated according to the most enlightened reason and the most generous care. Everything concerning food has been regulated by the law. It is the law which accepts or rejects every type of nourishment. A committee of scientists has been set up. And these scientists have indicated the most suitable ways of preparing each food. They have a book they've given everyone, and these are the foods you can buy and the foods you can prepare, and each family has a copy of the cookery guide. Okay, the foods are distributed to each family with an equal share to everybody. At every meal, they begin with a toast to the glory of the good Icar, benefactor of the workers, benefactor of the families, benefactor of the citizens. And they also have what they call the common dinner, where everyone eats together. And this allows the workers to fraternize and to simplify the housework for women. Because they're all in one place. With food, so it is with the law, which regulates clothes. A committee has consulted everyone and has examined the clothes worn in every country. So they've examined the clothes in every country and they've indicated which clothes must be adopted and which are to be avoided in this community. They've classified them according to the necessity, utility and pleasure. Everything that was extravagant or tasteless has been banned. Everyone possesses the same clothes. There's no room for envy or pride. Each of them changes clothes frequently according to age and conditions, and also childhood and youth and adolescence maturity and the condition of celibacy or married. So you, marriage. So you change, you wear different clothing depending on your state. Widowhood, as well as the various professions, are indicated by clothes. The clothes are manufactured in enormous quantities, deposited in immense storehouses where everyone is always sure to find immediately all that they need and is due unto them according to the law from each according to his needs, blah, blah, blah. How you would love these Ikarians if you saw how they surround women with attention, respect, and homages, how they concentrate all their thoughts and happiness upon the women. That is, this sounds fantastic, right? Yeah, I mean, they, they tell you what to eat, they tell you what to wear, they tell you what to do. I mean, who could possibly object to this? It's just going to be perfect when uh, the, you know, those smarter people who know really well and have studied all these things they just make all the decisions for us you know normal ignorant people then we'll just all be so happy yeah so yeah no autonomy as, as someone said there's no autonomy for the followers the leaders to make the decisions this is all central control from the top this is socialism right you have no choice in what you eat in what you wear what you do <clears throat> this is all i mean this is social control so yeah, I know. So, guys, so this is Humanism Canada. Okay, Humanist Canada. I, I previously have featured the American Humanist Association. So they have profound respect as well. 
Notice, according to their philosophy on their page, humanism is a philosophy, a stance based on a profound respect for human dignity, and we are all ultimately ex accountable to ourselves and to society for our actions. Our worldview is deity-free, free of deity, and we have to lead ethical and meaningful lives without reliance upon a belief in the supernatural, because, according to Marx, that was the early stage, right? Then we proceeded past that. So they're following the dialectic, right, of progress. Reason and science are the best ways to understand the world around us, and compassion should be the basis for how we act towards others. <clears throat> we want a fair and equal society. Well, we just read about a fair and equal society. Notice they're atheists, right? These are staunch atheists, but they have ceremonies. They have educational <coughs> services, church ceremonies and services. They bring humanism to communities across the country. They proselytize, and they raise awareness on the national stage. They're doing politics. That is your thoughts before I go on? Yeah, yeah I mean... Eliminate that that um, line. Our worldview is deity free, and it sounds exactly like a religion. Yeah. Now notice the seven fundamental tenets, and some of you will have, will be familiar with this already. We must strive to act with compassion and empathy towards all creatures in accordance with reason. Justice should prevail over laws and institutions. So cosmic justice. We need to do the right thing despite what the law says. Ask OBLM about that. Burn down those cars for justice. Beliefs must conform to our best scientific understanding of the world, and we must never distort scientific facts to fit our beliefs. And the spirit of compassion, wisdom, the hikmah, and justice should always prevail over the written or spoken word. Because, you know, you need to do what's right. Arkitsune, thank you very, very much. So, yeah, so, okay, are these two from the same organization? No, because these seven fundamental tenets are from the... Do you know which group they're from, Stadius? Do you remember? Yeah, I, well, I don't remember the exact name, but yeah. I think it's the Satanic Temple. Or the, the Satanic Temple, temple. Satan, yeah. So yeah, so these okay. so these tenets that you see here are from the Satanic Temple. Okay, so I'm just going to bring this up for a moment. I'm just going to show you guys this. So let me bring this up. Just so you can see that these very... So these are the seven fundamental tenets... And notice, this is from the Satanic Temple. There are seven fundamental tenets. And I think you'll notice that these are identical to that of the Enlightenment. They're identical to that of the Atheist Humanists. And in fact, they fall in accordance with those of the Marxists. So, understand, according to the logic that we operate with, secular humanism, the Enlightenment, are literally Satanic. So, Ray Johnson, thank you. That's, that's uh, yeah, there's a lot more behind the curtain, and we're just trying to dig that up. So, understand, we're looking at the satanic temple. So, these ideas of science, that's satanic. It's quite literally being used as an anti-Christian worldview. Now, LeVay's Satanism. Uh, Thaddeus, any comment from you before I continue? Nope. Okay. Now, Anton LeVay, his Satanism is atheistic, right? And he described it as a carnal religion. So, based on sex, basically. Followers believe that all gods are fictitious, just like, uh, spelt that wrong, fictitious, just like Marx did. Ultimate importance is found in the self and pursuing self-interests. This is known as narcissism. Would you agree, Thaddeus? Definitely. So, yeah, Satan, they say, is not a deity to venerate, but a metaphor, the ultimate adversary of irrationality and religious beliefs. So, in other words, Satan is the good. Satan fights against religious beliefs, which are evil. Of course, they don't believe in evil because there's no such thing as evil and Satan is not real, but you believe in God, so you are evil. However, that hurts my brain thinking about it. And the name Satan comes from the Hebrew for one who opposes. And they say you can have secular symbolism, ritual and pageantry, and it's very effective and something that is part of the nature of the human animal, which is why they co-opt religion for its functional value. The ritual chamber can be a place where you can dramatically perform what I call self-transformational psychodrama. We release the emotions that we find would be inspiring, injuring us in the regular pursuit of our happiness so we can let them go. So you need, if you need salvation, they've got psychology for you. Well, that is? Well, you know, that's a very crucial observation by the Satanists there, that humans need religion. Religion is part of the human nature. Now, we would say that's because God has created us in his own image and we naturally seek after him. Um, 
but it's very interesting that that you know blind chance and uh, you know random molecules moving around somehow has created this innate desire of all human beings to know God. Yeah, it seems very very consistent. Like seventy percent of the random matter that's smashing into each other are all religious molecules. So now it's not that so. we are just looking for disorder, chaos, and to undermine Western civilization. No, 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 no. We're really trying to endorse, as Satanists, we're trying to endorse for enlightenment values, bringing reason and respect for science into bettering the human condition. Marx did that. Stalin did that. All of these crazy socialists did exactly the same thing. They are simply following a satanic ideal. Uh, did I miss any comments? Uh, Johannes says, see how atheism falls apart when you merge some beliefs? Well, look, when you, when you examine atheism's history, when you look at its prophets, right, the, the, the philosophers who expounded the, the modern ideas of atheism, the, these people are insane, right? And this, the temple seven tenets speak to this worldview. They ask followers to act with compassion, to respect the freedom of others, and to take care that beliefs don't distort scientific facts. That's so cool. Oh. Awesome, awesome stuff. Only if atheists realize that they are satanic, that they are satanists, according to this definition. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, and you know, you, it, of course we know that's not their dictionary, so it's all good because they, they have a different dictionary that's in their own mind, but <laughs> the, the, the parallels are striking. And yeah. another parallel that you kind of, uh, you know, um, when the, the comment said that uh, when you examine atheism, it falls apart, or when you, you repeat their beliefs back to them, it falls apart. Uh, our Islamic friends and our atheist friends, they, they both seem to only want to talk about what they don't like about Christianity. They never want to tell us anything about their own belief system. Yeah. They don't want to win by default because they know that their own beliefs can't really hold up to scrutiny. Yeah, very interesting because yeah, do they do you think they want people to know this about the founding of their religion? Because they they probably at some level are aware. Just like Muslims will always attack Christianity. They don't want to go and talk about the Sharia, what's in what's actually written there. Yeah. So atheism, remember, this is humanist Satanism. This is humanism. Atheists are by default humanists. Humanist is like you can be like God. The atheists claim they can be like God. They are the highest of creation. Right? So, humanism is the new religion. Now, in an article titled, now, I have another set of slides on this topic, which is very detailed, but I will bring that up later, on the religion of humanism, which was founded literally and explicitly as a religion, just like socialism was founded explicitly as a religion. Uh, Czechs uh, wanted to ask you to send, ask to send you information. Um, go to my About page using a browser. Go to my About page, you'll find a, a you know, you'll find my email. So go to my YouTube channel, click on About, and you'll find an email link. So in an article titled The Religion of Democracy, <clears throat> see, Our Democracy, Rudolf Dreikurs argued that humanism should be thought of as religious because of the form and the content. Right? It's religious because of form and content. So this is the functional definition of religion. The new religion will probably be humanistic. It will be concerned with man and not with God. This new religion will have new principles, new rituals, and new symbols. Just like the Satanists just said, hey, we're going to have symbols, we're going to have dress up, we're going to have our own little thing going on, our own little LARPing going on. He's an Austrian psychiatrist and educator who developed psychologist Alfred Adler's system of individual psychology into a pragmatic method. Adler has, of course, created his own religion called ethical culture based on humanism. So... These guys are just competing with the atheists. Oh, sorry, the, these atheists are all just competing with the Satanists for who's going to make the new religion to replace Christianity. And, yeah, any comment before I go on? Uh, this is the final slide, I think, guys. So, yeah. Uh, so, slide uh, 51 out of 44 is the final slide. Sorry, my bad. Yeah, clearly, uh, <laughs> I'm from Africa, right? We have, uh, I attended a school for emotionally disturbed teachers, okay? You don't learn a whole lot. <laughs> It's all good. It's all good. But I mean, just, you know, I've, we've said this several times, but it bears repeating that everyone who we've looked at, whether, you know, they use the term socialist or communist or atheist or humanist or, or, you know, any of the other weird terms that we saw, they all want to do the same thing. They all want to replace Christianity with a new religion. 
no one actually wants to just adhere to no religion whatsoever and just uh, believe in blind chance or whatever. They all want to create a new belief system. Mm -hmm. Odd. And these are atheistic belief systems, full worldviews, an entire philosophy. And they want to try and convince you that atheism is just a lack of belief because nature adores a vacuum. No, these are entire philosophies. And yeah, they're not exactly, you've seen how crazy they get. This comic book view of how people are going to live in their communes with the bins of clothing. Just go grab some clothes. Now, philosophy, Protagoras and Aristotle. Aristotle will make famous that we are political animals. Human beings are political animals, and political society is not so much the final accomplishment of mankind's long journey, but the condition of possibility for human life. Don't forget, on the left, you'll get this, that, that the personal is political. They believe everything is political, right? So, which is always associated life, right? So, human life, so this is about Protagoras, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and the importance of technical skills as the key condition for human progress. This brings us to scientism. This brings us to the scientific elite. To technocracy. So these ideas go way back to the 4th, 5th, and 6th century BC. They go back as far as the 6th century BC to Protagoras and some other philosophers, the Sophists. They go specifically back to the Sophists. So according to, uh, you know, hold on. Okay, so hold on. Let's just let's skip this for a moment because I will come back to this. But notice Protagoras is the guy responsible for man is the measure doctrine. Right, which introduces us to relativism. He says that man is the measure of all things. Only what man can perceive through his five senses is real. But of course, what you perceive and what I perceive, what I know and what you know, are two different things. And therefore says we both have the truth. But what if these two positions are diametrically opposite? How can they both be true? So this is obviously an incoherent position, but this is quite literally the philosophical position on which socialism and modern atheism is built. So relativism particularly in the area of morality, is popularly seen as characteristic of the sophists generally. So this is a discussion for the next set of slides where we're going to learn about how the sophists actually are the people that, that stand under the foundation, the philosophy used by atheists, which is not based on the Logos. And notice, Aristotle complained about this Protagoras guy, and he claimed that to make the weaker or inferior Logos stronger or superior. So they developed a form of argumentation, a form of disputation, a clever but fallacious set of reasoning that allowed you to present weak arguments as strong. The Muslims call it hiyal, obligatory lying. Uh, your thoughts, that is, before I go on? Final slide? Yeah, uh, just uh, you mentioned that relativism is the foundation of socialist thought, of communist thought, of atheist thought. You missed one, though. It's also the foundation of modern western pop culture where everyone's right no one's wrong never question anyone uh, no matter what they say yeah so there's no objective truth there's no objective standard because there is no god so therefore everyone is right hence the whole uh if you look at oprah your truth and your truth no no it's not your truth it's the truth there's an essential objective truth and so you need to understand the foundation of your philosophy and will do so that you can understand their worldview so you know what you're defending and uh, yeah so final slide this is from a paper that i've been working through uh, i've been reading a handful of uh, different papers on this this is from 1935 a discussion on humanism now humanism technically is founded officially in 1928 right by a bunch of people and it's continued until today so humanism obviously is secular humanism or atheism if you will right this is a 1935 thesis on this and it says here the term okay However, can be used, humanism, the term can be used to describe the intellectual movement of the 5th century BC in Greece. That's why humanists always seem to want to say that they have a long, proud tradition, a philosophical tr tradition going back to the Greeks. Yeah, yeah, our tradition goes back to the pagans, is what they're actually saying. We are doing scientific paganism is how we need to interpret that. And in fact, they don't go back to Aristotle, they go back to Protagoras, who was who taught people how to lie, quite literally, as a sophist, taught people how to lie, got paid money, got wealthy, teaching people how to tell lies. So this was initiated by the sophists and was carried on by Socrates. And Socrates, unfortunately, carries a lot of blame for the creation of the Islamic Caliphate, as well as he carries a lot of blame for the philosophical foundation of socialism. 
So the, the spirit of the movement is well expressed in that famous maxim given to posterity by Protagoras. This is the most famous of the philosophers. But also, he was, there's another nihilist philosopher called uh, Gorgias, who believed that nothing exists. He was a nihilist. And this has also influenced modern scientific thought. And he said that man is the measure of all things. And I believe this was the final slide. Yeah. So, yeah, Thaddeus, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, that quote may or may not be clear in its meaning. Um, so let me just put it a different way. That man is his own God. Yeah, yeah. And what you perceive, what you think is right. Of course, what if your view is limited? Then, but you're still right. So chaos. This is chaos. Yeah, you know, everyone's right. No one's wrong. You have your truth. I have my truth. Um, we, we can just agree to disagree about what the facts of the situation are. Unless, of course, unless, of course, you have a Christian perspective, then that is just wrong. Everyone's right, except the Christians. Yeah, yeah. And there you go. So, guys, this was our discussion on uh, socialism and how socialism is an atheist religion, a secular religion, and introducing us to some of the ideas, some of the people, and now at the end, a little bit of the history. Um, I do say I need to go back and clean up one or two slides, but uh, a little bit of the history, which also leads us to the next set of slides where I'll be talking about the founding of, specifically, of atheism. Right? We need to have a look at well, how, did atheism, how did atheism get started? Where does it come from? Is it, is it really this ancient pagan set of ideas? Well, yes, it is, but it's also a modern pagan set of ideas. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's 2,600 years old, and it's also, it's, it's, yeah, it's as dumb today as it was then. Right? Also, nothing, atheism as a concept was different back in the time of the Greeks. It con was considered completely different than it is today. So don't let them pull the wool over your eyes. And we're going to find out. Also, for, so for the next, for our next magic trick, I went through about 30 different major academic encyclopedias, references. And of course, atheists are like, that's not my scholar. That's not my dictionary. You know, I do my own definition. I believe it's like this. I don't care about those, those scholars. I don't care about those, just like Muslims, tossing science suddenly under the bus. But... I went and looked at the definition of the word atheism from like three dozen major academic texts. And somehow none of them seem to line up with what atheists tell us atheism means. So that'll be my next talk. Uh, maybe a Sunday we can tackle that if you'd like to do something with that on, on Sunday, that is. So yeah, yep. I'll leave the final word to you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to that presentation, going through all the various academic sources dictionaries encyclopedias philosophical texts whatnot and maybe we can finally figure out what the definition of atheism is because um, much like islam every person seems to have their own definition and uh, whoever we're talking to they are the ultimate authority and we should not listen to anyone else uh, I also wanted to say thank you to all those who donated today. Um, I know that it is difficult for, for Lloyd to find the time for this, not because, like, uh, you know, not because he, he's working 100% of the time, but because of the massive amount of time that goes into this. And, of course, just like everyone else, he needs to buy food and, and shelter and whatnot. Um, so your donations help him put more time into this and less into other matters. Um, so those are very helpful. No, thank you very much. Yeah, it, is, it actually is very helpful, and I'm very grateful for that. It does make a difference. And yeah, it's atheists that are telling you that you can uh, take a little carving knife and become a woman, right? Or just put on a dress or a wig and Bob's your uncle, you can have babies now. <laughs> so this is just the opening slide to my, or the cover slide. If atheism is merely a lack of belief, then what is the opposite of theism? I mean, that's a logical question. So if God exists mm -hmm. is theism, God does not exist is what? Apparently it's not atheism because atheism is just a lack of belief. This is just word games by these atheists. Okay, that is just word games, right? And we're going to be going through a whole bunch of these. We're going to be talking about this in depth. And notice what yesterday was still religion is no longer such today. And what today's atheism tomorrow will be religion. And all the communists of 1845 were followers of Feuerbach. 
So guys, yep, I will call it here tonight. And thank you very much, Thaddeus, for joining me. Thank you everyone for your time. And again, thank you for those donations. I really do appreciate it. Thanks to those who joined the channel. And um, yeah, I will be in touch and we shall do some more work. And hopefully this is helpful to you. Please uh, take notes, have discussions with atheists and ask them about their religion. Ask them why their views line up identically, identically with the Satanists with Marx, with Lenin, with Stalin, with the, literally the worst genocidal maniacs of the last 2,000 years. Ask them, are you the baddies? I think it's a fair question. All right. Thank you, guys. Good night. Um, Thaddeus, last word, anything? Uh, well, I dropped a new video today. Andrew Tate is the perfect Muslim, so go and check that out. We'll be, I'll be out together with Lloyd again soon. Don't know the exact date, but we're definitely doing lots more things together. Some on his channel, some on mine. So keep an eye out for that. Have a great week and God bless. God bless, guys. Take care. Good night. Bye-bye.